this morning. Uh, I think this is perhaps the fifth time I've been over to meet the group. Uh, I get taken to a different part of uh, Northern Ireland every time I come. But this is the closest, I think, to the airport. Um, <laughs> I'm actually retired. Uh, I gave up my job. Uh, I retired my job as the Director of Public Health at NICE at uh, Christmas, and I'm now out to grass uh, amidst the dreaming spires of Cambridge. Uh, anyway, what I want to start with is to talk to you about something that was kind of implicit in one of the questions before the break, which is the difference between individual and population level health. These two things are often confused, and much of the muddle that we see sometimes in public health and in policy comes from a, a misunderstanding of this. So question one is about the individual. Why is Mr. Smith, why has Mr. Smith got sick? Why is he ill? But if Mr. Smith lives in Glasgow, um, there's another very interesting question, which is, uh, why is the health of the population of the west of Scotland worse than everywhere else in the United Kingdom? Now you might say, well, because there are lots of people like Mr. Smith who live in Glasgow. But that doesn't really explain very much, or at least you can't explain both those things in the same way. So what you actually require are two different types of explanation. You need to explain why Mr. Smith is ill, and you need to explain why the pattern of population health in a particular place is worse or better than other places. Now, uh, in order to do that, it's just a nice little diagram to start us off. We have a causal pathway uh, with some kind of exposure at point X, which has produced the illness for Mr. Smith at point Y. Um, but there's another kind of thing going on at point A, which leads to the patterning of health in the population, such as the one that makes the west of Scotland the unhealthiest place um, in the UK to live. One explanation is about the individual, one explanation is about the population. So, let's have a think about um, how we might explain that or work with it. Um, Population explanations are not achieved simply by adding up all the Mr. Smiths. That doesn't explain anything. Uh, what you need to do is a rather more elaborate kind of understanding of what's going on. And the example I'll use to explain it to you is about asbestos-related disease in East London. In fact, where I grew up, in a place called Barking. Now, this is a picture dating from the early 1900s of a factory that was built in Barking uh, by the Cape Asbestos Company, one of the biggest asbestos companies in the world um, at the time and for many, many years. They built the factory in Barking because Barking was outside of the London area, or rather it's about a hundred yards away from the border uh, marked by the river roading that set Barking separate from, Barking was in Essex, from East Ham, just over the river, which was covered by the London County Council. And the London County Council, in the 19th century, because the danger of asbestos had been discovered quite a, well, in the late, toward the last quarter of the 19th century, it was known that it was a dangerous substance. The London County Council had very strict rules about what kind of factories could be built. If the factory was doing dangerous stuff, the LCC didn't allow people to build their factories there. So over the border, over the river, in Barking, the local council welcomed the Cape Asbestos Company um, because it brought jobs, because it brought employment, because it was going to be good for the economy of Barking. And so it was. Now this is another old photograph, but why it's the same thing. This is over here, um, the factory with its chimney. That building there is a school. Um, and Barking Council erected its public school, one of its public schools in North Street. As you can see, it's about 200 yards um, from the asbestos factory. I'll leap ahead with a story. Um, about a year ago, I was contacted by a firm of solicitors in Manchester acting on behalf of a boy that went to that school um, during the 1950s who had died um, uh, then a year or so before from asbestos related disease. The exposure to asbestos and the development of the diseases associated with asbestos can take to upward of 40 years. Sometimes it's sooner than that, but there's a, there's a long latency period with the disease. And that boy had been exposed to asbestos fibres from the factory <coughs> during 
um, his childhood. We know that their children there were exposed because um, the factory used to puff out asbestos fibres. They used to land in the school playground and the children played with the asbestos fibres because it was like snow, we would throw it at each other. The school I went to, um, is, you can't see it, was behind here uh, about 400 yards, the primary school I went to, about 400 yards from the Cape Asbestos factory. And so all of us as children were exposed, but all of the population too. Now, what I'm illustrating here is this. If you die of asbestos-related disease, it is, of course, because you've been exposed to the asbestos fibres. But Barking in Essex and the surrounding areas of East Ham, back in, in the London uh, County Council area, the old London County Council area, Ilford to the north, Dagnum to the east, there still to this day is an excess number of people dying from asbestos-related disease. The factory actually closed in 1969. So we're getting almost past the 40-year latency period. To get a job in the Cape Asbestos Company, it was really helpful if you had a relative who worked in a factory. They liked to employ families. So what you see is a, a pattern of the disease running in families. Not because it's genetic, but because of social factors. Wives of people who worked in the factory developed asbestos-related disease, because the asbestos fibres came home on the overalls that the men and women wore to work. Um, now, the patterning of the disease, the fact that you've got this excess number of deaths in this particular part of East London, to this day, is about the population level effect. It's about economics, it's about political decisions that were made by the council, and indeed political decisions made by the London County Council, which kept asbestos out. It's about um, the economy. It brought with it um, employment. And until the last 30 years or so, Barkham was actually quite an affluent. It was always a working class district. It was quite an affluent working class district. Um, there was scarcely any unemployment. It's a very different picture now. But then, until about 30, 40 years ago, it was a, a relatively affluent working class community. But its affluence brought with it a relatively heavy price. Other industries nearby also used asbestos in large amounts. <clears throat> There's a firm called Kitson's Insulation, um, which is actually a Glasgow company that did shipbuilding and lagging in shipyards. They had a big factory and men went off to do casual work all around the country as they did from Glasgow too. And again, you got a job in that casual workforce if your dad or your uncle or your brother worked in the industry. Not a biological factor, but a social factor. Now if you think about that as one single example <clears throat> of the difference between a population effect um, and an individual effect, you see the importance of trying to tease these things out. It's no good trying to explain why you've got an excess rate of death from asbestos disease biologically looking at barking. You need to understand the history, the politics, the economics, and so on. And with fantastic, I don't know if it's a sense of irony, um, stupidity, or brazenness, but when the factory was knocked down um, and taken away, they, they built a council estate on it. Um, didn't clear the ground terribly well, but just so no one didn't ever forget what was there, it's called the Cape, um, the Cape, I lost it now, Close. Cape Close, and the Cape Estate in Barking, near Barking Station at this day. If you don't know where Barking is, get on, if you get to central London, get on the district line, keep going towards as far as you can go, when you get past West Ham's football ground, two stops further on, and you are, um, you are there. We can find similar examples, not just barking, I, I'm very interested in this and I'm still studying the mortality registers from the 1920s and 30s, so we can plot the deaths and provide a more detailed description than what I've just given you um, of that. But it's a beautiful example of the difference between population effects um, and individual effects. Now both are important, you can't have the one without the other, um, but you need to bring them together if you're to understand the nature of these kinds of uh, these events. Now, we've been kind of misled in the way we've sought solutions to public health problems down the years. Um, and this reflects a question you asked before the break about individual things and behaviour change. And I just want to reflect a bit on that and enlarge on the question that you asked. This is actually a cartoon from the London Times. Um, 1854, and it represents the fact that that's the River Thames here, that the um, 
that the, uh, the Grim Reapers uh, sculling along there, um, which was an absolutely filthy, dirty river in the mid-1950s, which most people in London, most politicians thought was the source of much of the disease. Um, but it was the gases that came off of the river, the smell of the river, that people thought was the source um, of their ailments. And in particular, cholera, which visited epidemics on London and many other cities too, um, through the 19th century. 1854 uh, was one of the biggest outbreaks of cholera in that period, and so the Times had this lovely cartoon. Now, the Victorians came up with some solutions which are not about individual behaviour change. They were about technical solutions to solve the problem at an upstream kind of level. They built the most fantastic sewer pumping system. This is the beam engine in the Crossness Sewage Works, which is on the south of the River Thames as you travel down the river uh, towards Gravesend. And this great beam engine, there were four of them in the Crossness Sewage Works, pumped all the sewage out of London um, away from the, um, the, and got rid of the smells. This sewage system uh, and these engines were part of a much bigger undertaking. Uh, if you've ever been along the embankment, the Thames Embankment in London, this is the Thames Embankment, which runs for several miles in bank the River Thames here. This is still Charing Cross Station in London, and that's the bridge called Hungerford Bridge. Uh, runs out of Charing Cross Station with the um, South Eastern Railway on it. But it's underneath that's really interesting because what you have underneath here are the pipes carrying clean water for Londoners and beneath this the sewage system um, carrying away the sewage. And actually you've also got the district line, they built the railway underneath it at the same time, this fantastic engineering project. Now this, it, when you think of this, it's amazing and these uh, fantastic public health reformers achieved the most extraordinary things in the 19th century. They didn't ask anybody to change their behaviour. This is Edwin Chadwick, uh, a great believer in the miasma theory that disease was caused by the gases and the smells. And this is Sir Joseph Bazalgette who actually built that system that we've just looked at. Um, probably as important an engineer as Isambard Brunel, and certainly in terms of lives saved, um, probably, a, you know, one can put it in the, one of the great public health heroes. So it kind of sounds like we've got a problem, which was the terrible outbreaks of cholera. Um, <clears throat> we have a solution, the engineering problem, and then we have improvement because cholera more or less disappears from London from about the 1860s onwards by the time the Thames Embankment and the sewage system was finished. And uh, one of the great historians of the 19th century, great American historian Christopher Hamlin, has argued that water and sewage, and I would put in brackets now, until the internet, close brackets, probably the most widely diffused technical complex in human history. Uh, we've exported it all around the world um, as this very successful system. Other great reformers of that era, William Duncan, first medical officer of health in Liverpool, um, William Farr, who came up with the idea of collecting data, mortality returns, um, by house. And he was more or less the first person to gather what we would today call health inequalities data because he reckoned if you plotted the deaths against the address and you knew that the, who the head of household was in that address, you, can't, you got a, me a measure of social status. And actually it's a measure we've used pretty well modified but pretty well ever since. That was invented by William Farr, statistician uh, in the government. And he was the one who gathered data during the 1850s which showed where the outbreaks of cholera were occurring, uh, which allowed others, notably John Snow, to begin to plot on the maps that Snow developed what the causes of the cholera might be. This is William Virchow, a European reformer, um, and he's most famous for this they did a lot of things, but this phrase which um, he, he, he gave us, medicine's a social science and politics is nothing more than medicine on a large scale. Um, what Virchow argued for is that you, you can't separate the biological and the political and the social. You need a population perspective as well as an individual perspective. But actually it wasn't as simple as that. You might have thought all those Victorians would have been grateful that people were sorting out the problem. 
that when Jon Snow, in 18, the outbreak in August, September 1854 in London, began to use William Farr's data to plot where the deaths were occurring, particularly in Soho, and he began to reason that this was nothing to do with smell or gases or the miasma, but it was to do with something actually in the water, though he didn't know what, something in the water, that the Victorians would have been jolly grateful. That the Victorians said, wow, fantastic science is coming forward. It's going to say, well, it did. The vestry in Soho, the equivalent of the local parish council, listened to John Snow, and they stopped. They actually removed the handle of the Broad Street pump, which had been the source of most of the uh, cholera, what we now know as a bacteria. But don't forget, 1854, bacteria hadn't been discovered. No one knew it was there. It was the smell. And actually, as humans, we're hardwired to recoil from stinking filth. Human excrement, rotting body, you know, we recoil from that. And it's not unreasonable to think there must be a cause and effect relationship between that smell and the disease. But of course, the smell is caused by the bacteria and other things working away um, on the various matter that's there. Snow didn't know what it was. Um, but he knew it was in the water. Were the population grateful? They were not. The Times editorial, the very month, the very month of the cholera epidemic in London, thundered away, the nation which is but the aggregate of us all is little disposed to endure a medical tyrant, Mr. Chadwick, Edwin Chadwick, the great reformer, and Dr. Southwood Smith, one of his um, collaborators in the ministry, have been deposed. And then they said, and we prefer to take our chance with cholera and the rest than be bullied into health. Amazing. And in fact, as Basil Jett and others tried to come up with their schemes, it took them nearly 20 years to get them built. We should never forget that. The Victorians didn't have an overnight solution, didn't have a magic bullet, didn't even have the answer because Basil Jett, Chadwick uh, and others still thought it was in the gas. If you get rid of the smell, you, you solve the problem. Um, but it was a 20-year struggle to actually reach the point. But we forget that it was a 20-year struggle. We think there was some sort of simple cause and effect relationship. And much public health has been dominated by the folk wisdom or the folk memory along that causal <coughs> path, perhaps with its sideways uh, movements into other things over the years ever since. And it's what I'm going to call this morning the pathogenic approach, the notion that there's a simple preceding pathology, which if we can find it, we can sort the problem out. Just as the Victorians did. Except, of course, they didn't. Koch didn't discover the existence of bacteria until the 1880s, nearly 30 years later, when it was possible to see under a microscope what the microorganism was that caused the de massive dehydration in the human gut, which is what kills people with cholera. Did you know, by the way, in the early part of the 19th century, a Scottish doctor in Leith, near Edinburgh, worked out that you could cure cholera by rehydration therapy, which of course to this day is still the main therapy. But he was ridiculed by the scientific community of his time and died unknown um, for it. If you pump people full of enough water, you could deal with it. Now, the pathogenic approach is associated with, the name was given by an American writer called Aaron Antonovsky. And he studied blue and white collar workers in the United States in some of the earliest accounts of health inequalities. And what he discovered is what we probably all now know in this room, that people who have relatively higher social status tend to die at an older age than people with relatively lower social status who die younger, both individually and in population terms. And Tadoski developed his ideas by traveling from America became one of the foundation professors at what was the new university, the new Hebrew University in Jerusalem, um, via Aberdeen, where he met a bunch of medical sociologists um, who kind of put him on the right track uh, to working out something really very important. He argued, if you seek to try to find the original pathology, you will always be asking the wrong question. If you seek to try and find a single initial cause, and you focus on that, you ask the wrong question. He got the idea for this 
from his study 